This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardere, broadcasting from the International Bariatric Club Studios in San Diego, California. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery exclusive event is Reflux Revisited, and will feature experts from the United States, Mexico, Thailand, the United Kingdom, Chile, India, Israel, Egypt, and Australia. We would like to thank our partners, Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, Facebook, Bariatric News, Cinemed, and Explorer Surgical for setting up promoting and accrediting this webinar, which is sponsored by our platinum sponsors, ConMed, Medtronic, Ethicon Endosurgery, CMR Surgical, Lexington Medical, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, WL Gore, Reach Surgical, Carl Stortz, Bariatric Solutions, Baxter, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquipan Fixate, Bang Medical, our silver sponsors, Mass Bariatric Technologies, Richard Wolf. This 32nd IBC Oxford University webinar is streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and via IBC Instagram. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon and director of IBC Global Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London, and Christ Church, Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Namir Katkuda from the United States and will be moderated by Dr. Vandana Soni from India and Dr. Camila Bosa from Chile. My co-chair today is Professor Namir Katkuda, who is Professor of Surgery of the University of Southern California. He is also President of the California Chapter of the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. And in 2006, he was awarded the Knighthood of the Legion of Honor for his pioneering work in laparoscopic surgery. This is Francis highest honor. He has published 120 peer-reviewed papers, 100 book chapters, and three books. Our moderators today are Dr. Vandana Soni and Dr. Camila Bosa. Dr. Vandana Soni is from India. She is consultant bariatric surgeon and director of the Max Institute of Laparoscopy, Endoscopy, and Bariatric Surgery, and Max Super Specialty Hospital, New Delhi, India. Dr. Camila Bosa from Chile is a consultant bariatric surgeon, medical director of the Center of the Nutrition and Bariatrics Clinica Las Condes in Santiago, Chile, future president of IFSO in 2024 for the Congress in Santiago, Chile. I will now pass it on to Professor Namir Katkuda to introduce our first speaker. Do you hear me? Yes. Welcome, okay. Professor. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ariel, for the nice introduction. I'd like to introduce now our first speaker, uh, Dr. Kelvin Higa, who is a clinical professor of surgery at the University of California, San Francisco, and director of uh, minimally invasive surgery in Fresno. He's a past president of IFSO and ASMBS uh, to give his talk on acid and bile reflux after MGB cause from concern. Kelvin. Oh, thank, thank you, Namir. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, um, let's see if I can get my screen up here. Um, all right, how's that looking? Okay. Wonderful. Perfect, perfect. Namir, you, if only you had a headset. I don't know, you should get a headset somewhere. I don't sure. So we're gonna talk about uh, reflux today and uh, cause for concern. These are my disclosures. And um, I think the most important is that my personal experience with the one national gastric bypass or the mini gastric bypass is one. And that was a conversion of a BBD to an OAGB. And it wasn't planned that way, but it turned out once we got in there, it seemed that was the most appropriate operation to do. Uh, and, and the patient uh, did well after about eight months in the hospital. So we have to ask ourselves, if this is a problem, what is the true instance of reflux, especially reflux in, the, in our population, the morbidly obese? I think uh, we can go way back into 2004 with Michel Souter. Uh, when he looked at all of his patients, 345 patients over a four-year four period, and really did the appropriate uh, uh, workup at that time, which included endoscopy, pH monitoring, and stationary uh, manometry. They didn't have high residues at that time, I don't think. And all of the patients, uh, 119 of them, uh, 
35.8% reported at least monthly heartburn and or regurgitation, but none of them had dysphagia. But if we look at this, he reported uh, hadial hernias in 56% of patients, reflux esophagitis in 315 now, albeit most of the reflux was, was a rather mild uh, reflux, but there was a number of GI pathologies found in these patients. And we have to know that even today, it is not our standard of care to do this kind of workup. In the pH monitoring, the Nemesis score is on the average 22.48 abnormal findings in over half, little over half of the patients. The patients clearly are refluxing, having acid reflux. Now, interesting, the manometry wasn't so bad. It was normal in three quarters of the patients, 74.4%, but in 17.7 had a low LES pressure. And the conclusions that were symptomatology was very common, but similar to the general population of 35.8 versus 40%. But the prevalence of GERD, true GERD, was very high, 31.4%, as opposed to 3 to 5% in the general population. And that it postulated that the manometry wasn't, uh, didn't look so bad, but most of the reflux was probably due to transient LES relaxations. So what about the one analysis gastric bypass and why is there a controversy? What about bile reflux? Does bile reflux occur? This is a nice study for patients uh, pre and post-op at six months. They used endoscopy and bile reflux scintigraphy in 12 patients, 31.6. They had bile in the gastric pouch and only one patient had bile in the esophagus. So what? So bile is commonly seen in the stomach. We know just by regular endoscopy, and it seems to be higher in the sleeve gastrectomy on routine endoscopies. But this is the problem. So you have bile, but there seems to be some pathology. It's like anastomosis. There is inflammation, ulcer, and foveolar hyperplasia that wasn't present pre-op. In the pouch, there was, again, uh, hyperplasia and inflammation. At the GE junction, there is inflammation and, in fact, uh, some gastric metaplasia. So even though bile may be native to the stomach, something after these operations may be a little bit more pathologic. Only one patient had reflux esophagitis with bile, so it was really not too much to comment on. How about 24-hour multi-channel uh, impotence uh, pH studies? 11 patients, 12 months post, the MESER score went from 24 to 40, but non-significant because only a small number of patients. And while the acid reflux episodes decreased, the non-acid reflux episodes increased. And de novo GERD developed in two patients. And those who had reflux all got worse. And if you look at this, it's really not, <clears throat> it's really the non-acid reflux that increased, even though there was some acid reflux in the upright position. Why are we concerned? Because of this. And this is interesting because it's the first report of a carcinoma developing after a one anastomosis bypass. It's a 52 year old male, BMI of 52, had grade C esophagitis, but no biopsies were taken. In January, had a one anastomosis bypass with a standard 200 centimeter BP limb. And it had occasional reflux controlled easily with pantoprozole. In 2019, two years later, new onset of dysphagia, BMI was down to 32, turned out to have a G2 adenocarcinoma, a T2 N0 M0, well, underwent new adjuvant chemotherapy and esophageal gastrectomy. And the patient uh, with, did very well, all lymph nodes were negative. Now what's good about this is they were able to use the remnant uh, stomach to use it as a conduit something you cannot do with a sleeve gastrectomy. So uh, they could reconstruct this patient fairly easily. And the path, there's Barrett's, but no residual tumor. So the patient is free of disease. Now in commentary, you know, it was the time from pre-op endoscopy to where they discovered it's consistent with having the cancer already there, not necessarily uh, de novo caused by the bioreflux, and I agree with that. At two years, it could have been there at the beginning. They didn't do a biopsy, inadequate workup. But they also pointed out the OAGB has variants. 
that may or may not reduce the risk of bioalkyl dyers. So you see the original mini bypass by Rutledge and the Carbajo modification uh, a little bit different in the configuration. So my conclusions, I agree with them that the endoscopy may have been, uh, if they had didn't biopsy, they may have found the uh, pre-existing cancer and the pre-op evaluation was suboptimal. But the very fact that bioreflux is concerned because there's modifications is significant. So what do we know about Barrett's bioreflux and such? Well, most of what we know are <clears throat> from rat studies and not necessarily human studies. So the combination of acid and bile is, does promote Barrett's and, and, and subdural cancer. Now, if you do an anti-reflux procedure in rats with Barrett's, it does not eliminate the risk of cancer but does so before development of Barrett's. So anti-reflux surgery can protect the risk of cancer before Barrett's occurs. Once it occurs, it doesn't seem to. And interestingly enough, if you use proton pump inhibitors, it seems to potentiate the development and progression to cancer, whereas a low pH environment has a protective effect in rats. Right? And this is important because if we take all of our patients who seem to have symptomatology because of acid reflux, we put them on PPIs, maybe we're not doing the right thing for them. And it's important to point out that this model, the esophageal jejunostomy in rats, is not the same as the OAGB model, okay? Because this is direct contact of the bile into the esophagus, whereas you still have the LES in the OAGB. So another group out of France, Jean-Marc Chevalier, looked at this model, the OAGB in rats, a 30-week study, demonstrating that there was reflux in the esophageal genosomy and the OAGB rats, but not in the sham studies. So clearly there is bioreflux. There was intestinal metaplasia in 40% of the EJ rats, but none in the OAGB rats. So again, this model for esophageal cancer normally may be appropriate for patients who have an esophageal genosomy, but not necessarily the OAGB. But what about the gastric bypass? Is that so much better? Well, there are problems. So this is a study of 47 patients with reflux after the gastric bypass. And I can tell you for sure, this does occur. Now there's a lot of reason for this. Some patients have uh, esophageal uh, dysmotility. A lot of them have hypotensive lower topical sphincters increased acid uh, exposure, and uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and, and a finding that was kind of interesting that maybe uh, we can promote discussion is the idea of developing de novo hydrohernias after bariatric surgery, which is a phenomenon I think is underreported. What about the sleeve? I don't think there's any discussion. I don't think there's any contrary about the sleeve. The sleeve can promote reflux. It's, it's just pretty clear that patients who have reflux can get worse and get an oval reflux. But if you look at the manometric studies, the real studies of the sleeve, and this kind of points out some of the problems we have with literature, that the LA's pressure does lower, okay, after surgery. Um, but the number of patients who have complaint of reflux can actually improve. So when we look at uh, patients, if we look at symptomatology alone, of course, a lot of these patients will get better. But if you measure their actual acid, uh, acid load and reflux, it actually gets worse. Now, why is this? Well, because we are disrupting some of the natural anti-reflux mechanisms whenever we do surgery. Now, this is not just consistent with a sleeve. This also happens with a bypass, as well as the one nasal bypass, where we disrupt the sling fibers. And, uh, and for some reason, uh, promote, uh, at least take, take away some of the anti-reflex mechanisms. So we'll mention the Omega trial because it's a, it's a randomized prospective trial looking at the one nasals versus the, the, the regular RUI bypass. And clearly there are issues with increasing esophagitis as well as uh, at least one patient with metaplasia and some gastritis, but not enough uh, and not long enough studies to see that there's a big difference between these two. So what can we all agree upon? The reflux symptoms in our population are more common than the general population. Symptoms correlate poorly with GERD and vice versa. We cannot rely upon simply measure of whether or not the patients tell us they have reflux, whether or not they're on PPIs or not. 
But reflux in itself is a rather benign disease, but it is a significant quality of life issue. We're doing surgery on a lot of our patients for improvement of the quality of life. If we induce reflux, that is contrary to what our goal is. Unless associated with Barrett's and esophagitis, and this is what we're concerned with, is some of our operations may in fact be promoting Barrett's and other pathologies that we may not see for 10, 20 years. Bile is certainly implicated in esophageal cancer. There's no question that, the, that esophageal cancer, as opposed to many other cancers, is on the rise. And it's changed from squamous cell to adenocarcinoma and baritophagus, and obesity is associated with the risk of cancer. So esophageal cancer certainly is on the rise. I suspect it correlates with obesity and um, what's happening there. So our take home message, the human foregut is a terrible design. It, you, you go from a, a low pressure to a high pressure zone, of course, there's going to be reflux. And in so doing, there are several mechanisms that have been designed to prevent this. You have the LES, you have the, the, the diaphragmatic sphincter, you have uh, esophageal motility and the sling fibers of the stomach. So it, it, it's as if it's a, a design that uh, we're trying to, uh, in, in ways, in the backward ways, how to prevent it. Now, weight loss can lower the intra-abdominal pressure and reduce acid and divert bile through surgery, but it's really dependent on the pout formation and the reception of the esophageal ligaments. Now, the pathogenesis of Barrett's in humans is really not known. Experimentally, acid reduction potentially Barrett's and cancer in the presence of bile. And if we treat reflux symptoms with PBI, we might be making this worse. And that's just a theory. Now, gastric bypass can actually resolve Barrett's, and the idea is <clears throat> that they both divert bile, and the risk of Barrett's and cancer should be less. But GERD symptoms can still be a significant problem after the gastric bypass and the renal switch. So, the ask is you're asking the question is acid and bile reflux after one anastomosis an gastric bypass, MGB, cause for concern? Of course it is. But we should also be concerned about the sleeve and the gastric bypass and any patient because all of these operations, reflux can occur. So to conclude, I think it's important that we uh, keep an eye on or understand what we're actually talking about here. Reflux is a benign disease, but it is a quality of life issue. What reflux is due to bile and bile and the esophagus, there's no question, bile and acid produces cancer, cancerogenic sorts of things. Just ignoring it or trying to excuse it away is not, is not uh, what we should be doing. We should be studying it and, and really understanding exactly uh, before and after what we're doing. And it, I, for one, do not understand why uh, the standard of care to this point to doing these uh, operations, and some of them are irreversible like the sleeve, don't require the same, the same preoperative workup that we do for say an anti-reflux uh, procedure, Nissen or, or a hydro hernia repair. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Higa. I think that was uh, a wonderful uh, lecture and uh, uh, you did uh, address uh, the concern for acid uh, by reflux uh, following mini gastric bypass. Although honest enough, at the beginning, regarding your experience with the MGB, you were honest enough to say that it's just one case. So uh, considering that uh, you most of your, the information that uh, has been presented is what uh, has been uh, uh, collected from literature, uh, what what is your in your own personal experience? How how would you place uh, the MGB in your list of choices for uh, uh, as a bariatric procedure? And will you ever offer this as a primary procedure for a patient? And what 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 will be your concern when you are evaluating a patient for an MGB? I, I would love to offer the MGB to my patients. I would absolutely love to have the ability to do this. And I'd like to study it actually, um, because it, it really requires, uh, like anything else we do, some study. My, you know, when I looked at uh, the literature even 10 years ago, there was clearly more patients with the MGB 
uh, and longer patients being followed, then the sleeve gastrectomy. And it made no sense to me that, uh, it, it, you know, it should be uh, an operation we should study and look at, but not just because, you know, I, I, we do, I do like to do, I talk to my patients a lot of different operations and try to tailor it to them. And we just don't know enough about these operations to say what's best for them. Uh, when I look at the MDB literature, it looks like it's a, can be a more effective and safer operation than the RUI. And when I'm teaching a RUI and I'm watching a fellow struggle and doing, taking an hour to do a simple JJ and anastomosis, I'm thinking, why can I then just admit, <laughs> just eliminate this altogether? and structure the BP limb according to the metabolic load. And then, you know, I have to understand exactly what the, the nutritional consequences long-term, like the Omega trial showed us, that they can be very significant. But these things we have to understand can be very um, uh, specific to the environment you're operating. So a patient with a 200 centimeter BP limb in France may do differently than one in California, for example, because of many different factors. So I, I think uh, uh, I would like to see this operation uh, available to me to, to, to study and look at. Uh, but I think the literature looks very promising when I look at it. And by now, we should have seen more than one cancer, right? We should have seen more than one cancer reported. Absolutely. I think there, there are very few and uh, far between uh, case reports on uh, any, any sort of malignancy following these. And would you, do you actually relate the acid bile reflux due to MGB or do you think that is an inherent problem of obesity per se? And it's just that because these are procedures where, uh, you know, the, the, the system is likely to be exposed to uh, those, uh, yeah, fluid. I mean, clearly, I mean, there may be, I don't know enough to know about the difference in modifications between the original MGB or Rutledge versus the Carbajo, you know, a modification and how that affects things. I do know that when we study our patients, the reflux is, com is complicated. You know, uh, we have patients with a gastric bypass. They're not refluxing bile and the cerulean is too short, uh, but they're clearly refluxing. Their LES is incompetent. They have a hiatal hernia, so their 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 uh, diaphragmatic sphincter isn't working. We destroyed the angle of his that sort of thing. There's many comp many issues that that can relate it to this. And um, when you, uh, I think that the incidence of bile reflux, the MGB is going to be higher than say why, but you have to offset that by, you know, is it safer? Is it more effective? Or is it applicable to more patients? You know, my my concern uh, right now, as many. Is a sleeve gastrectomy, which we know uh, is much more reflexogenic, and we're studying these patients. And you know, but you know, clearly, I'm doing a lot of sleeves, uh, but we are studying the patients intently before and after. Um, are there any patients on in whom you are offering a sleeve that you'd rather do an MGB? Um, <laughs> maybe so. Maybe lots of them. Okay, but then I'm also when we're talking about diabetes and glycemic control, I, I, I can understand, uh, and I don't know, and maybe the others with more experience can tell me, because I, I inherently believe that, that uh, when we preserve the pylorus, the, the glucose shifts after a meal are much better after a pylorus sparing procedure, DS or a water mass of DS, than uh, with a gastric bypass. I don't know what they do with the, with, with the uh, one mass was gastric gastric bypass. I don't know if they're, you know, quite, quite as wide, but I think that, uh, you know, the problem with postprandial hypoglycemia and dumping syndrome is it, a big deal uh, in our population with a bad, with a standard gastric bypass. It's not frequent, but it's still a big deal. Uh, and um, anything that can decrease that, I think this is going to be better in the long run. Uh, Professor Ariel. Thank you, Vandana. I think we're uh, going to uh, go to the next speaker, but I just wanted to tell Kelvin that he did a great job of not only addressing the issue of OAGB, but of uh, of our whole practice, which is bariatric surgery in general. And and maybe this will lead to uh, additional uh, research on how we can address the GE junction and uh, the anti-reflux mechanisms as we're doing the procedure, because as you well explained, we're actually undoing what nature has done so effectively uh, most of the times. But uh, 
thank you so much. Thank you, Fandana, for those questions. And uh, we're going to pass on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is going to talk about, will the concern over Barrett's esophagus kill the sleeve gastrectomy globally? Uh, and this would be uh, Professor Andre uh, Kedar from Israel. He is chairman of the Department of Surgery of Asuta Ashod Public Hospital Ashdod, Israel, and professor of surgery of Ben Gurion University, Israel. Uh, he will give his 15 uh, minute talk. So, Professor, it's great to have you with us. I will share the screen. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. One second. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I think uh, we don't have your slides yet. You have to go to share screen and find your presentation. Okay. Do you see my screen now? No. Okay, now we do. Okay. It's a great pleasure for me to be here among those uh, very renowned speakers whom I have heard uh, from papers, from books and uh, the topic today for me is uh, to answer the question if the Barrett's esophagus uh, suspicion of progression of Barrett's to esophageal cancer will put an end uh, to the existence of sleeve gastrectomy. So my case uh, mixture disclosure is that I do perform sleeve gastrectomies, but I must uh, underline that the most important, the most uh, prevalent operation for me today is a mini gastric bypass, single anastomosis gastric bypass, which I find uh, a pretty good operation. I was doing a ruined Y for a long time and I have uh, my teacher here, Professor Katkuda, uh, and I decided to put another slide that I have to disclose that uh, actually he was my uh, greatest teacher uh, when I was his fellow in 2004. And I still use this uh, needle nose uh, instrument for suturing. So now let's go further. So what happens with the sleeve gastrectomy as of today? Here is a paper that was published in 2020 and it describes the state of uh, numbers and increase in volume of sleeve gastrectomy in the United States. And we can see that since 2011, sleeve gastrectomy increased immensely. It uh, multiplied more than four times since that time. And in 2018, it was the most uh, prevalent operation in the United States and also in the world. And uh, among the primary procedure, its prevalence is even higher, as you can see. All other operations stays the same at the same rate, but the sleeve goes up. Together with that, we are facing some uh, problems with sleeve gastrectomy. And uh, there are different papers that uh, describe uh, uh, two, most, two most important reasons for conversions and for failures of the sleeve. The first one is the weight loss failure or weight regain, and the other one is uh, the reflux. Uh, regarding the weight, uh, we see that in the meta-analysis, there is a 20% conversion rate in, two, in 10 years of uh, sleeve gastrectomy follow-up. But if we look in the population-based uh, studies, which uh, just pull the data from the large population-based uh, database, like in this one in the United, uh, New York State, uh, in the United States, it showed only a 10% uh, conversion rate. And uh, regarding the weight recidivism, you can see that 
up to 30%, there, there is a way to either failure or regain. And they also state that there is a 20% of uh, revision rate after seven years. This is uh, all, all those papers are actually up to date papers. And uh, I think many of you, or maybe all of you, are familiar with those results. And what is important is that uh, in most of the papers, they also uh, describe that the weight recidivism usually comes with the increase in reflux symptoms. Okay, and uh, what happens to, to the reflux? We know that reflux is a very important risk factor for uh, uh, esophagitis and uh, as a consequence, due to reflux, we have the Barrett's esophagus. Here we have different uh, reports from all over the world. You can see uh, this one is from uh, Italy. It uh, describes 19% uh, of Barrett's esophagus. And uh, also they describe that this uh, Barrett's esophagus uh, was uh, coincided. It coincided with the weight regain, but only 4% in Chile with uh, more than 10 years follow-up in Aus Austria, Europe. 10 years follow-up, small group of patients, 43 by Prager and Felsenreich, 15% of uh, incidence of uh, Barrett's esophagus. Some other papers, this is the paper actually, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it says Felsenreich, but this is a paper from Italy. I think it's from uh, Braghetto who describes a 17%. So what we can say is uh, we can conclude that between five, more be four, and the 15%, the incidence of Barrett's esophagus. What, what, why do we uh, concern, why are we concerned with the Barrett's esophagus? And this is a very nice review article from the New England from 2014, which describes what is the Barrett's esophagus in the general population. All of you know that, uh, that uh, the only clinical significance of Barrett is that it can progress to the esophageal cancer, to the adenocarcinoma. It does not increase the squamous cell carcinoma, but it does increase the adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. What happened to the esophageal aden adenocarcinoma in the United States? In 40 years follow-up, it increased seven times. Maybe one of the reasons is the increase in the morbid obesity. We know that the same goes, uh, the same path, obesity goes uh, in the 40, last 40 years, it, the obesity increased maybe three times. And uh, probably it is one of the important, most important risk factors. The general population in the United States the long, the life long follow up shows that it has an incidence of almost 6%, which is pretty high. I would say pre cancerous condition, 6% in the general population in the United States, 5 to 6%, very high. Swedish study on the opposite shows a much less. A much uh, lower incidence of the Barrett's of, of the esophagus of the Barrett's esophagus. So when we talk about the Barrett's esophagus uh, and esophageal cancer, we have to discern two types. One is non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, and the, another one is dysplastic Barrett. So when we look at the old data, we can see that uh, the progression from Barrett's esophagus to the adenocarcinoma of the stomach of the esophagus was stated as up to 1% a year, which is pretty high. A person who lives 10 or 20 years uh, with Barrett's esophagus, and Barrett could appear in the age of uh, 40, 50, the person has up to 40% if he expected to live up to age of 80 or 90 years old, he will have a almost 30, 40% increase a chance of having, of developing the, of the adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is pretty high. But the latest data 
And you can see this is from the last uh, decade, from uh, all from 2000, uh, after the 2010, I pulled uh, two important papers, one from gut and another one from clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. The incidence is stated as much lower. So this hype of high incidence of progression of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus from pre-existing Barrett is probably a little bit too high. So the real incidence is 0 0.1 up to 0 0.3. But what happens with the dysplastic Barrett esophagus with high grade dysplasia, we know that Barrett could be without dysplasia at all. It could be with a low grade dysplasia and it could have a high grade dysplasia. And this condition is already uh, carries a very high incidence. You can see up to 10% progression to the carcinoma of the stomach uh, of the esophagus a year, which is a very, very high. And those are papers from uh, also from uh, last 10 or 20 years. Uh, when we look at the most important papers, you can see here that uh, the progression with uh, no dysplasia, ND is a no dysplasia to esophageal adenocarcinoma. You can see it is very low. It's 0.3%. Uh, I think it's very low. Uh, low grade dysplasia, you can see it's only 0.5%, five uh, per 1,000 year person years. And when we have a high grade dysplasia, it is a very, very high number. But let's look at the papers in the publications and the literature. Here we have only, only to underline that those numbers are consistent among the different papers. And this is the also overview from the surgical clinics of North America from 2015. And all of them are actually up to date data. So when we have the progression of Barrett's esophagus to adenocarcinoma, up to now, the data we have shows that there are so many factors that I'm not sure we can count all of them. Here you see the table of biomarkers for risk stratification. I think most of us are even not familiar with all the names we have in this table. Uh, genetics, uh, PCR, fish, aneuploidy, all those names are not really for us, for surgeons but we have to understand what is the real, what are the real risk factors. So the more, more important risk factors are listed on the left side of the, of the slide. So first of all, when we have a dysplasia, we have to do a repeated pathological examination by another GI pathologist, because the implication of this are actually very important for the follow-up and for the treatment. And after we have that, we have to take into account all this uh, list of things. And this is only the beginning. I, I didn't show all the list, but if the patient has a hiatal hernia, if he has a, still has a morbid obesity or maybe just an obesity, what is the segment, length of the segment that is uh, affected by Barrett esophagus? What is the life expectancy of the person, sex, race, all those has, have important influence on the actual incidence of progression from Barrett esophagus to adenocarcinoma. So all this sounds uh, intimidating to perform an operation that can lead the, the patient that we operate on to expose him to the risk of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is a very deadly cancer, one of the most uh, uh, important causes of death of uh, cancer mortality. But uh, let us try to understand what do we know about the real uh, occurrence of esophageal cancer after sleeve gastrectomy. So in the literature up today, up to this date, I found only four case reports. Every case report describes only one patient with the esophageal cancer after sleeve gastrectomy. And after we look at the four of those, we can exclude the first one. You can see this lady was diagnosed 
four months after the sleeve gastrectomy with the esophageal cancer. And in the methods, they state, they state that no preoperative esophagogastric imaging, neither endoscopy nor uh, upper GI swallow study were done. And four months after the sleeve gastrectomy, the esophageal cancer appeared. It's clear this lady was already suffering from this, from the, uh, from the cancer at the time of the index operation. But the other three other cases that are described, all of them come from different countries, one from Argentina, another from France, and the last one from New Zealand. You can see here that those patients probably did develop an esophageal cancer uh, after the sleeve gastrectomy as a consequence. Two and a half, three and five years post, post the index sleeve. Uh, when we try to understand if this risk is uh, real and uh, so much uh, important for, for uh, our patients, we try to understand is there is a difference is there a difference between different bariatric operations to develop an esophageal cancer? So we have this paper from a sword from this year, which comes from Quebec, from Canada. And it is a paper that uh, accumulated up to 5,000 patients with a follow-up of more than seven years. And they divided two those patients, bariatric patients in two groups. One, the first group is the operation of 4,100 patients who underwent an operation that is reflux prone, duodenal switch and sleeve gastrectomy and compare that to the RYGB, to the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, which we all think is a protective operation. And they tried to, to compare if there is a difference in the esophageal cancer. So, I'm sorry, we don't have, I don't have my slide here. What was the finding of this paper? Is that uh, there is no difference. I think it is pretty interesting to say that there is no difference in the esophageal cancer incidence between the sleeve gastrectum and ruin Y gastric bypass, but that was what was the finding of this paper with the follow-up, which is very good up to seven and even more than seven years. Here we have a paper from uh, our friend Michel Gagnier, who wrote this in 2016. And uh, this is an intriguing uh, question. The name, the th the the name of this paper is, is sleeve gastrectomy is an absolute contraindication in patient with Barrett? The answer, uh, quite surprising, is it is not. Way, uh, I think everyone has to think what is, what does, what is his opinion about this uh, condition? Because uh, if we compare the risks of operation for uh, developing the esophageal cancer. And we know the patient has Barrett esophagus. Still, it, is, it sounds to me that everyone will decide to do not a sleeve, but probably will choose a ruin Y gastric bypass. Uh, here, I want to show you some data that we uh, collected in our country, in Israel. And uh, unfortunately, I still didn't uh, finish this paper because uh, of the corona and I couldn't uh, go and uh, access all the all the databases I need but I will show you uh, as it is as is and we collected all sleeves that were performed in uh, four private hospitals in our country between 2006 this is the year when the sleeve of gastrectomy started in our country and up to the end of 2010 it's clear that since it was a private hospital, there were many different surgeons who performed the operation, many techniques, many different follow-ups. And also the pre-operative workup was different. Many of the patients probably did not have the proper imaging of the esophageal, uh, of the esophageal uh, area. But anyways, all of those patients underwent uh, sleeve gastrectomy 
and we uh, pulled the list of those patients and we compared this with the National Cancer Registry by the identifiers that are that were available to us. And we had a, a list of cancer incidents up to the end of 2017. So we have almost 1,500 of patients who underwent sleeves with the follow-up approximately of 10 years, between eight to 12 years. Uh, it is a little bit less than 10 years, but it's up to 10 years. And uh, we don't know, still this data is lacking. I will have to work on that uh, further, but we don't know maybe some of the patients already don't have their sleeve configuration were converted to gastric bypass. We have pretty a lot of operations now converting uh, our sleeves that were done five, 10 and 15 years ago. And uh, we don't know if all of those patients are still alive. This is the work that we will have to do. But among those 1500 of patients with 10 years of follow-up, there was none, even, even not, not even one cancer of, not even one case of esophageal cancer. I would say uh, that uh, when I tried to do some uh, epidemiological uh, inquiry, uh, I found that in our country, the esophageal cancer is not a very prevalent condition. We have only Three 100. Three okay. more minutes, please. Yeah, I'm finishing. We have a pretty low incidence of esophageal cancer. We have a population of 8 million and only 150 cases of esophageal cancer in a year. And it makes an incidence of very low, one in 50,000 persons a year. And uh, probably to answer this question, if SLEEV increases the incidence, we have to, to, to collect at least, I think, 5,000 cases of SLEEV gastrectomy and multiply it by 10 years to have uh, one case. But we will continue doing that. Uh, I think for today, we cannot conclude uh, clearly if uh, SLEEV gastrectomy will continue to exist due to the uh, due to this uh, risk of uh, Barrett's esophagus and progress, progression to the adenocarcinoma of the stomach. But I think what is important is that the concern over Barrett's esophagus is not the only condition that is important in the prevalence of bariatric operation. What is the good oper bariatric operation? I think the good operation is easy to maintain and we can see that Sleeve here and bend are easy to maintain, very good operations, very easy to maintain. And you can see the bigger the circle here in the table, the higher the impact of this uh, feature of each operation. So sleeve is very easy to maintain. Easy to teach, I think sleeve is one of the best operation in this term because uh, sleeve is easy to teach and uh, it requires a shorter learning curve than the gastric bypass. Uh, sleeve gives a pretty good short term or medium term weight loss. It is comparable to the gastric bypass, but when we go further, the long term weight loss maintenance goes down with the sleeve. And this is, I think, uh, one of the negative impact it will have. Uh, sleeve has low complication, no question. It is a lower complication operation than the duodenal switch or gastric bypass. And the comorbidity improvement is not the best with the sleeve gastrectomy. But is it a good operation? It is very easy convertible. We can convert sleeve to any other operation very easily. It was designed to be converted to a duodenal switch or to gastric bypass. So I think if we have to answer this question, I think the sleeve gastrectomy is a very good operation because it increases access to the bariatric surgery. It allows many surgeons who were not able maybe to perform, uh, to overcome the learning curve of bariatric operation 
to start performing the bariatrics. And the, the risk of barite esophagus progressing to carcinoma of the esophagus probably will still, uh, uh, still will last for 10 or more years until we reach the 20 and even 30 years follow up after the sleep. This is the end of my talk and thank you to all the members. You're muted, Professor Namir. Somebody muted me. <laughs> you hear me now, Andre? Yes. yes. First of all, it's great to see you, and so I'm so proud of you. One Thank of the greatest you. surgeons in in this area of the world. I'm so proud of you, the numbers and everything. Your career has been commensurate with your talent. I wanted to give you a a. Uh, a heartfelt congratulations. I am always proud of you. You know that. I have just one simple question, Andre. Uh, you made a point throughout the, your presentation that the sleeve is actually a good operation. Um, there is no data really anecdotal. Three cases were, because if somebody had cancer after a sleeve, they'd immediately publish it. So I, three publications, in the whole planet, that's not a lot of cases. Let's say even 10, let's say even 10 out of hundreds of thousands, millions maybe of sleeves. So we can reasonably conclude that the sleeve is not a cancer promoting operation. You agree with me? Reasonably. Uh, I, would say I would use more caution because we, for now we have uh, the follow-up is probably 10 to 15 years. And we know that the barite esophagus or the uh, reflux uh, can cause, have a leg time period between 20 and even maybe 30 years after the beginning until it progresses to the, to the esophageal cancer. But still, we do know that sleep promotes barite esophagus, but there are no cancers. So I think something is different in sleep. Maybe the pathogenesis of the barite in sleep is not the same as in the other reflux, uh, reflux uh, conditions. I don't know. I don't know either, but, but, but why, did you move, why did you move to mini gastric bypass? Uh, we have, uh, I think we have performed maybe more than 50,000 of sleeves uh, up, to, up to now in, in Israel. And we have, uh, I think, more than five years of follow-up average of those uh, 50 thousands i think maybe even 70 thousands and uh, now we have a lot of failures we see many patients coming back reflux and uh, weight loss failure or weight regain and uh, i think it, that what happened with the band exactly the same uh, pathway we were very very active in doing a lot of bands 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And now the band is maybe 1.5% 1, 1 of, of all the bariatric operations in our country. So the sleeve was, was very, very high, I think two, three years ago, but slowly, slowly, mini bypass overcame. Now we have a mini gastric bypass is 55% of all the bariatric operations in Israel. Sleeve, I think about uh, 30 or 45, and the rest are ruin wise and uh, a little bit of study. Thank um, you, Andre. Congratulations for, for your presentation. Camilo Bosa from Chile. Here we, we do a lot of, of sleeve mastectomy also. So, based on what you presented, I understand that your, your, um, your bad impression about sleeve is basically up on weight loss, but not on reflux. Uh, and, and what is your your concern in terms of reflux between uh, between sleeve and mini gastric bypass? You think it's not a big issue in any of those, or you think it's much worse in the mini gastric bypass? Or basically, you think this is a is a show and there's nothing really 
uh, all the benefits of weight loss are um, are taking over any risk of reflux. Uh, well, there is a concern of reflux in mini gastric bypass, but in sleeve we have, I think, 40 or 50 percent of uh, patients suffering from gas from a uh, reflux, while in the gastric in mini gastric bypass, I think it's. The literature shows very not low numbers of one or maybe 2%, but I'm sure it's a little bit higher. It's maybe five or even more, but still 5% of reflux is not, a, not such, a, such a big concern. Also, when you have a ruined Y gastric bypass, 10 years of follow-up, you can see that also ruined Y have uh, some reflux and the, the conversion of mini gastric bypass to ruin why is very easy. So once you have a patient who, who is suffering from bile reflux, and you, we have to remember that the reflux in the mini gastric bypass is not an acid reflux, it's much more bile reflux. And it's very easy taken care of by conversion to ruin why. So my main concern answering your question is the weight loss. I think the operation is designed uh, to answer the only and the most important question, the obesity. So mini gastric bypass, in my opinion, is better in this term. And one last uh, small question. Where do you think mini gastric bypass and sleep should have a formal uh, follow-up in terms of Barrett's and reflux? or you think it's only upon symptoms? Because based on what you're saying, do you think we should do a screening, a formal screening? Or what would be, or do you have any, any protocol in, in Israel or something? It's, as you know, you know, probably it's, uh, I think, the same in all countries, that the follow-up rate is very low after five years among the bariatric patients. But if I do a conversion, and I have done about uh, 120 cases of uh, sleeve conversion to another bariatric procedure for now. I don't do a conversion without performing an endoscopy and GI swallow. I do both. And uh, I, I must admit, I saw only one bariat esophagus in, our, uh, in my, in my uh, series of 120 20 patients of sleeves. But uh, I think it would be very wise to, to make, a, a, to propose a, that the follow-up after sleeve, starting five years after the operation, must include a upper GI endoscopy. But I think it's, it's very hard to persuade bariatric patients. They even don't perform the vitamin levels. So it's, it's our uh, very, very, I think, very hard, uh, a task to, to make uh, bariatric patients to perform this uh, follow-up. I think it is a wise uh, proposal to have uh, all patients after sleeve and mini gastric bypass be screened starting five years after the index operation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, uh, I think let's move on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. I think that was a very interesting uh, talk you gave and uh, what we can understand uh, with the changing scenario in uh, the type of surgical procedures being offered for morbid obesity. It's a very dynamic field. And yes, we are still looking for an answer. And I think uh, these discussions do make us move forward. It gives me a great pleasure now to introduce the next speaker. We'll have Mr. Shafiq Javes from UK, and he's going to give us a lecture on uh, giant hiatal hernias in the severely obese to mesh or not to mesh. Mr. Shafiq Javed is a consultant bariatric surgeon at the Phoenix Health United Kingdom. He's a consultant minimally invasive esophagogastric cancer surgeon at the Liverpool University Hospital NHS Foundation Trust, Liverpool United Kingdom. He's an honorary lecturer at the University of Liverpool United Kingdom. Over to Mr. Shafiq.
I think you're still mute. Can you hear yes. me now? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. You see the screen now? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Okay, so um, thank you very much for your invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, be presenting this topic. Uh, the topic I've been asked to discuss is giant hypercerny and severely obese, to mesh or not to mesh. So when I was discussing with Harris regarding this, there was an understanding, there's a positive data on this subject. And I wonder one of the suggestion was that we should probably make it uh, more like a discussion, which I should have actually taken up, but anyway, we're here now. So I have no declarations regarding this uh, uh, presentation. Um, Oxford University definition of high hernia is the protrusion of an organ, typically the stomach through the esophageal opening in the diaphragm. The number of uh, um, classifications that exist, but most commonly used seem to be the, these uh, Type 1 hydrocenia being the sliding, type 2 paraesophageal, type 3 mixed sliding and paraesophageal hydrocenia, and type 4 with involvement of other organs, uh, including transverse colon, uh, omentum, small bowel, pancreas, etc. Uh, the obesity is a recognized risk factor for uh, development of hydrocenia, as is the advancing age. So, both these uh, characteristics increase the risk risk of developing um, high dystonia. The incidence is reported anywhere up to 50%. This is one of the studies looking at 181 patients undergoing assessment for bariatric surgery with an upper GI study. A average is over 44, BMI 43, and um, in all comers, high dystonia weight is around 37%. But if you look at medium and large size high dystonia, which is what we are talking about probably in relation to mesh, um, that incidence is much lower. It's around about 4.4%. Uh, and other studies seem to kind of uh, broadly agree with these figures. There is also increased incidence of failure of anti uh, hydrocenia repair and anti reflux surgery uh, with increasing BMI. So, so the procedure tends to be more challenging and long term outcomes not so good, um, both in terms of recurrence of hydrocenia and uh, failure of phenoplication uh, uh, where. So with that in mind, um, the indication for high dyshernia repair um, are broadly that any symptomatic uh, paraesophageal high um, should be repaired, particularly those with obstructive symptoms and uh, those with evidence of gastric volumes. For type 1 asymptomatic hydrocenia, there is good evidence that they, they can be left alone. Exception being the bariatric surgery, uh, where there is weak level evidence that um, any hydrocenia pounds during bariatric surgery should probably be repaired at the time of surgery. So hydrocenia is not obviously all about mesh. We all know that. So there are certain technical things that we have to take care of. Um, mesh being one part of those. So first thing is dissection and excision of sac. I think it's quite important. It also lends itself to proper esophageal mobilization. And the, the second issue, which is repositioning and restoring the gastroesophageal junction within the abdomen, at least two to three centimeters below the level of diaphragm. And deal with the issue of so-called short esophagus. Um, and in majority of hydrocenia that involves extensive dissection of esophagus, which will actually allow the restoration of intra-abdominal segment. But where that cannot be achieved, then a lengthening procedure like colis gastroplasty or something have to be considered to actually make a durable repair. Tension-free corrosion of uh, diaphragmatic crura. Again, that may be simple cruroplasty in small hernias with good quality crura but uh, it may require other procedures like lateral release, buttressing and mesh reinforcement and, um, to actually achieve um, a reasonable quality repair. Fundoplication is considered um, um, uh, an integral part of a hydrocenia repair procedure. Uh, in sort of morbidly obese patients, 
um, it could possibly be uh, changed to a bariatric procedure instead um, so that um, a long-term weight loss is achieved, which will then contribute to the durability of vital repair. So in these populations, instead of chondroplication, one might consider a bariatric procedure as, as an addition to, to the hydrocellular repair. And then finally, uh, some sort of PAXI, be that a hill type repair of gastro, uh, sorry, uh, fixation of gastroesophageal junction, um, a gastropaxy, or even a gastrostomy to try and reduce the incidence of uh, hydrocellular uh, recurrence in the future. So if we look at the, the, the bariatric or morbidly obese population, um, we have case reports of giant hydrocellular repairs with ruin wire gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. We also have some institutional kind of case series and, and results uh, with a slightly larger number of patients, usually in tens and twenties. And basically these studies establish the feasibility of uh, doing a hydro honey repair along with the bariatric procedure. This is the, the study um, looking at bariatric population on, with a high BMI uh, and comparing the mesh versus not mesh. This is from uh, Rome. And they actually, it's a non-randomized study. They, they took 96 patients uh, and based on interoperative finding, they actually uh, divided them into two groups. Um, they used a mathematical calculation to work out the size of defect at the time of surgery, basically measuring the distance between pleura and using the, the calculation to work out the, very, uh, the area of the rhomboid. And so they divided the patient to less than four centimeter def, uh, def, defect with a good quality pleura. And these patients, they only performed the posterior pleuroplasty. Um, and then had the equal number of patients who had the, the defect slightly bigger, four to eight centimeter, uh, and the weakness of right crust. And in those patients, they did the pleuroplasty, but also used a bio-A mesh to reinforce their repair. They excluded any uh, sort of bigger height surveys from their study. So the group A, which is the, the simple repair, were followed up for 21 months, and uh, the group B for 19 months. And they found that the recurrent reflux symptoms uh, were six in um, simple repair group versus two in um, mesh reinforcement group, giving um, just about uh, the statistical significance. Um, in terms of hiatus hernia, there were 12.5% recurrence um, in simple repair and no recurrences in hiatus hernia group. And considering that those were the bigger defects with the, with the, with the crural weakness, this probably has slightly more significance that is shown by, by the steps taken in the city. But we've not got any other direct comparison studies in bariatric populations. So we have a look at the general studies uh, regarding mesh versus non-mesh repair um, in high hernias. Uh, we do have a, a handful of randomized trials, most of them relatively small, small numbers. Um, so I've just couple to just uh, highlight some of the, uh, the issues. So this, this trial is an early one published in 2002, 72 patients larger than eight centimeter height hernias. They were randomized into two groups, 36 each. Um, one group received the posterior chloroplasty, the, the simple repair with missing fundoplication. Other group had same, but had only PTFE mesh reinforcement. They assessed them uh, with gastroscopy and esophageal gram at three months and then six monthly afterwards. Median follow-up is around 2.5 years um, and recurrence rate was 22% uh, in control group and none in PDFA group. Um, and this was highly statistically significant. There's uh, another trial um, uh, where they randomized 108 patients from four centers, primary repair in 57, primary repair with small intestinal submucosa, mesh buttress in uh, 51 patients. 90% patients completed six months follow up of a GI study. And in those uh, patients, control group had 25% recurrence and the mesh reinforcement group 9%. Again, 
just reaching uh, the statistical significance with p value of 0 0.04. We, uh, we've got a, a few uh, slightly longer term follow-ups. So this is um, yeah, again a, a trial of 126 patients from Barson Group in, in Australia. They randomized in them into three groups, uh, suture repair, um, absorbable mesh, and non-absorbable mesh. Um, they reported one year results um, for recurrence, which were pretty much similar in all three groups with no uh, significant difference. Um, they were able to follow about 72% of these patients up to five years. And um, at five years, recurrent rates in the people who were followed up were still pretty much similar with no significant difference. So there's another uh, similar study where they have 108 patients uh, with that is a short-term phase one study, but then they went on to follow these patients up, um, up to a uh, um, median range of 58 months. Um, they obviously lost some of the patients, 10 of them died, 26 lost to follow up. So they were left with 72 patients follow, uh, sorry, available for uh, follow. Um, and out of those 60 patients actually had an GI study. And out of those 60 patients, 20 in uh, simple repair group, which is 59%, and 14 out of 26 in a mesh reinforcement group had um, uh, recurrence, which again is similar. So in the, on the longer term studies, limited number, but there doesn't seem to be, uh, there does, doesn't seem to be much difference um, in outcomes. We've got a couple of uh, syst um, systematic, uh, well, we've got a few systematic reviews as well. I've been through a couple in there. So, but they suffer with the same problem that the quality of studies to include is really not great. So you can only conclude what, what is available in the literature. So this one had four randomized trials, um, all with less than 100 patients in them, nine non-randomized studies. So they ended up with 700, just over 700 patients with a mesh repair compared with um, 750 patients with a suture repair. And they concluded that recurrence rate of hernia was reduced 9.4% uh, in suture group and 2.6% in mesh group, which is statistically highly significant. There was no difference in complication rates. Quality of life was better uh, with the biological mesh, overall quality of life, but the dysphagia scores were lower with the, with the suture repair. There's another meta-analysis which basically looks at uh, various things, but the two things that are presented here is, is that the risk of hiatus hernia recurrence is reduced with a statistical significance because the overall graph is, is uh, to the left of the, the curve, but actually need for the surgery is overlapping. So although there is a trend towards sort of mesh having an advantage, it does not reach the statistical significance. So quite kind of mixed picture. So this is the, the study that was published last year, uh, last year, which probably gave Harris the idea of the, the, the topic uh, for today's discussion. Um, this is uh, from the Barcelona group who actually did a literature review of clinical studies, um, expert views in form of published Delphi processes, mesh related complications and long-term results of quality of life. And they concluded that mass, mesh reinforcement reduces the hernia recurrence rate Mesh-related complications are few but serious, and they recommended that mesh only should be used in specific circumstances, particularly in related size of, size of defect and the quality of corona. Um, there was no consensus among the experts or no high quality data to recommend a specific type of mesh over another one. So answer is unknown. So in conclusion, I think incidence of high hernia is higher in morbid obese patients. Incidence of recurrence of high hernia and reflux following um, uh, surgery is also higher with morbid obesity. High hernia surgery can safely be performed uh, with a bariatric procedure. Uh, small high hernia probably can be repaired with a suture with an acceptable outcome. Um, 
mesh reinforcement should be considered for uh, larger hypersomnias with, uh, with pillars. Absorbable mesh may be better in long term in, um, in relation to long term complications, but we do need more studies and a lot of good quality data to actually uh, answer conclusively answer some of these questions. And that's all I have to say. Camila. Hi, uh, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Very nice, very nice presentation. Um, I would like to, to ask you, uh, what, 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 is your, what is your perspective today about this, this issue? Uh, are you deciding on a size of hernia where you're gonna use a mesh or not? Uh, because sometimes it's basically not possible to close the, the atlas, and it's not a matter of if you want it or not. Sometimes you can. Um, and what is your feeling about the bio, the, the biological or bioabsorbable meshes? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, you know the size of the hernia is one factor, but there are other things: the quality of the diaphragm, so on. And sometimes even you are trying to repair it, and you bring it together, and you can see it fall apart straight in front of your eyes. So that obviously that kind of repair is not going to last. But there's no doubt some hernias would require some form of reinforcement. I think the concern has been around the permanent matches, the, the, you know, the, um, the PTFE or um, you know, proline and so on, polypropylene, because they stay there and they, the complication they cause is the erosion and the severe dysphagia, which are and, and other which are quite serious. And, and that is really uh, the concern regarding liberal use of mesh in this sort of situation. I think some of those issues get addressed by biological matches, not necessarily all of them, because there are some studies showing that early dysphagia rate with biological matches may be higher because they invite a degree of sort of immune reaction in that area or inflammatory reaction which leads to early dysphagia, but they're also still showing that that might be a temporary problem. So you may settle eventually. There's no doubt there are some hernias you can't repair without some form of reinforcement. And I think currently biological meshes and possibly absorbable meshes are probably the, the best choice. And one, one other small small question. Uh, I have a very personal experience. My, my mother was operating on a giant hernia, nine centimeters. Um, I didn't do the case, one of my colleagues, and it was necessary to put a mesh because it was not possible to close. And she had the worst dysphagia for a year and a half until uh, she had a dilation. And after that, she was totally perfect. And since then she's been okay. Mm. However, uh, I would say that dysphagia must be one of the worst symptoms I've ever seen in a patient. It's the, the, they are really miserable. It's even worse than, than the reflux symptoms. So um, I'm not sure what is your impression about the, how the, the, the collateral symptoms are uh, addressed in all these papers using measures on, and, and deciding on, on uh, other symptoms. Yeah, I mean, some of these papers do, I, I've not included that data, but they do look at quality of life data. And, and overall, and some of these comparison groups, the overall there is improvement in quality of life sort of questionnaire scores and things like that in those patients. But I think there's no doubt that there's a small group of patients who do develop quite troublesome dysphagia symptoms. And some of them are lucky enough to get a, resolved with a dilatation or crippled dilatation or whatever. But there's some of them are much more persistent and then eventually we'll end up with some sort of revision of procedure. So, so it is an issue, but I think it's an issue in a small group of people rather than kind of overall bigger population. Thank you. Wonderful, and one quick, quick question so we can pass on to the video um, discussion. Uh, we already know that this is a very challenging subject and sometimes it's pretty subjective because you're sizing a hernia. Now, 
the perfect storm is having to do a weight loss surgery that is prone to complications and reoperations and deciding on what uh, type of material to use to avoid having these either very, very severe uh, complications, infections, et cetera, or the reoperation uh, challenge. Uh, is there any preference in material when we think about how high the reoperation rate is now around the world for bariatric surgery? Uh, for in, in relation to hiatus hernia, I mean, as we alluded in, there is no good quality data to guide us. In the literature, there isn't really anything to recommend one kind of mesh over another. There is a genuine concern about the permanent meshes to be used in the hiatus area because they persist there for long term and they can cause complications or have potential to cause complications years down the line. So on that basis, I think if, if I have to choose a mesh, I will probably use um, an absorbable, um, a biological mesh. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Shafiq Javed. That was a great presentation. And we're going to pass on now to the video discussion. And uh, the video discussion is on mesh fixation strategies in hiatal hernia. So we're going to see some videos. And I want to present, of course, our chair and our co-chair today. Mr. Evangelos Etimiu uh, from the United Kingdom is consultant bariatric surgeon and honorary senior lecturer at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital and Imperial College London, UK. And our co-chair is uh, Professor George Fielding from the United States. He is Professor of Surgery at New York University, NYU, Langon uh, Medical Center in New York in the United States. So I wanna welcome both to our uh, video session and I'm gonna invite our, both our moderators and my co-chair to present the expert panel. So uh, Vandana Soni, uh, Namir Katkuda and Camilo Bosa will be presenting the rest of our expert panel for this video session. So I'm going to pass it on to Vandana. Uh, you're muted, Vandana. Okay, thank you. So, uh, well, I'm presenting uh, Professor Lena Kethan. She's from the USA. She's Professor of Surgery Director of the Metabolic and Bariatric Nutrition Center and the East of Egypt Swallowing Center at the University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio, USA. And she's a board member of SAGES and chairs the Forgut Committee. Welcome, Professor Lena. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Jambalingam. I think you have to introduce the next speaker. Oh, or is he the next? Sorry. Or oh, do I introduce him too? Yes. Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Well, welcome, welcome, Mr. Uh, Jabulingam. So he is a consultant upper GI bariatric surgeon and clinical lead for bariatric surgery at Newton and Dunstable University Hospital, UK. He's honorary senior clinical lecturer and esophago gastric cancer surgeon at the Imperial College Healthcare, London, UK. Welcome. I would like to introduce my good friend, uh... Professor Marina Kurian. She is a clinical associate professor at the New York University, immediate past president of the New York State chapter of the American College of Surgeons, and a good friend and a great surgeon. And also Professor Karim Sabri is an associate professor of surgery in Shams University Hospital and head of the Department of Surgery at Wadi Al Neil Hospital in Cairo. I would like to uh, introduce Farah Hussain, the Division of Chief of Bariatric Surgery at Oregon Health and Science University, USA, and Chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the ASMBS, and the uh, ASMBS Foundation Board Member, uh, and with a large clinical and revisional surgery practice. And my super best friend, Ken Loy, from Australia, uh, consultant bariatric upper GI um, and hernia and oncology surgeon, director of the St. George Hospital Obesity Surgery Center in Sydney, Australia, current treasurer from the IFSHO Asia Pacific chapter. Um, welcome to, to this meeting and thank you especially to Ken, uh, because I, I think now it's like 4 a.m. in Sydney, you know? That's good, good timing. So maybe we have to wake him up. 
<laughs> we'll keep him awake with this video session. I also want to present Professor Juan Antonio Lopez Corvala from Mexico. He is uh, past president of the Mexican Society of Laparoscopic Surgery, of uh, Obesity Surgery, and IFSO El LAC, and director of the Program of Obesity Surgery and Laparoscopic Surgery in Hospital Angeles Tijuana, also professor of the University of Baja California. I also want to uh, in, uh, welcome Professor Suthep Udum Sawing Soup from Thailand, uh, Associate Professor of Surgery, Director of Chula Bariatric and Metabolic Institute, Director of Chula Minimally Invasive Surgery Center, Chuchalon uh, Corn University, Bangkok, Thailand, and President of the Endoscopic Laparoscopic Surgeons of Asia, ELSA, from the 2019 to present, and President of the Laparoscopic Endoscopic Surgeons of Thailand, LEST, 2019 present, and President elect Asia Pacific Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, APMBSS. And uh, of course, Professor Kelvin Higa, he's Clinical Professor of Surgery, University of California, San Francisco, Fresno Medical Education Program, Director of the Millennium Invasive uh, and Bariatric Surgery at Fresno Heart and Surgical Hospital. A past president of IFSO and past president of the ASMBS. Thank you all for being with us today. And I'm going to pass it on now to Mr. Evangelos Eftimu to introduce the cases and then play the video showing the three different methods of mesh fixation during hiatal hernia repair. Professor Evangelos. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, I have no disclosures. The only disclosure I have is I have used uh, for the last 10 years only one type of mess, and this is a biological mess which is based on collagen. Uh, Harris gave me the brief to present some um, fixation techniques of a mess. He gave me the instruction to create a short uh, video including uh, these uh, different techniques of uh, fixating the mesh. So these are not very other cases, there are three short videos. The first one is a uh, uh, gentleman in his mid 70s who was admitted under the medical team with anemia and he was found to have a large hiatal hernia with uh, most of the stomach in the chest and uh, also an organizational volume that was contributing to his anemia. The other two cases as routine cases, really refluxers with sizable hiatus hernias that they needed to have uh, the chloroplasty reinforcement of the hiatus. And I will reiterate Mr. Javid's uh, uh, remarks that uh, when you have a sizable defect and uh, you start getting a bit of tension, then you start thinking about reinforcing the hiatus. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now with the videos. Uh, let's see if I can play that. Okay, so this is the first case. Is a, most of the stomach was in the chest. Uh, we ended up with a really sizable defect uh, and uh, big hiatus defect there. A little bit of loss of the epimysium on the left cruise is the time is the uh, time to do the chloroplasty, uh, which I always do a figure of eight with the uh, ethibond non-absorbable suture. Uh, and I start low and try and approximate the hiatus gradually. Uh, the, the mess I use is a, is a uh, synthetic mess. And in this case, I use the glue uh, to keep the mess into position. Uh, there's a little bit of... Uh, tension there on the top suture. Uh, and uh, I use a second mesh on the top to close the hiatus a bit further. The second case, again, now it is the chloroplasty uh, repair. It's a smaller defect. I try to approximate the chloro loosely. I don't like this phase. It's very difficult to treat and it's a very distressing symptom. Uh, we have a tube inside the uh, esophagus with the 34 friends. In this case, I use the same mesh with the biological mesh and I use absorber tags. Uh, this is the inferior phrenic vein. Always careful, try not to uh, uh, pierce it because it can bleed quite a bit. And this is the appearance of the reinforced hiatus with the use of uh, protax. Uh, And the last one is a suture fixation technique, which uh, it's 
much more controlled and further, far more reliable uh, in my uh, books. Uh, the tags are very difficult to use. You can, if you're not careful, you can easily go somewhere. You should in either the aorta or the heart, uh, which has been reported to happen. So this is the chloroplasty, again, rather loose, same type of mess. Uh, biological mess, and this time I use uh, anchoring sutures to hold the mess into position. Uh, and I use four or six. Uh, I've got one on the top, one on the bottom, and I use uh, another couple uh, right and left just to hold the mess into, uh, hold the mess into position. And this is the final result. The mess is held in place with uh, sutures. What you do, you rely on the uh, uh, fixation uh, and uh, formation of fibrous tissue uh, to keep the uh, repair together. Uh, I haven't had any experience with uh, a lateral release. It's a method I've never seen. I've never used it, but I have used enforced with EPTFE, uh, usually in reoperations uh, where there is a lot of scarred uh, crura from the previous surgery, which is less pliable and doesn't approximate as easily as the, as the primary procedure. So that's my uh, videos uh, and uh, we will say the discussion, I guess. So, Professor uh, Evangelos, I'm going to ask you uh, to maybe move your computer a little because your audio is not that great. Okay. But in the meantime, uh, let's uh, ask Professor George Fielding to start the discussion with our panel of experts. George, are we muted? Oh, there. Are we good? Now you yeah. are. So, so now we're. That they, those three videos to me just represent the progression of severity of, of the hiatal hernia disease. And um, I thought the dissections were, were beautifully done. I have to say in the big, um, the really big hiatal hernia defects, particularly in the obese, I'm personally a fan of doing a relaxing incision behind the spleen, uh, sliding it across and then repairing the defect of the relaxing incision uh, with the mesh. It keeps the mesh out of the hiatus. And I, I, it's just, um, it seems to me to be a reasonable option in these gigantic ones. Because over the years, all I've learned, it doesn't seem no matter what you do, a, a chunk of them are going to come back. And I think if you can be reoperating uh, in these giant recurrent hernias and you don't have mesh there, it seems to me I've found it technically easier. Uh, to just be dissecting in scar tissue rather than scar tissue plus uh, mesh. So, so that would be my uh, take on it so far, Ariel. I would agree with that. It was uh, um, it's very uh, difficult when you operate on a scar hiatus, particularly where there is a mess. And that's why I always uh, stick with biological mess because it doesn't create as much scar tissue as a synthetic. Uh, as I said, I don't have experience with the relaxing in season. I've never actually seen, I was never trained with to do that. Uh, most of the giants, once I do it, they tend to be in elderly, late yeah. 70s, early 80s, really. Uh, and uh, as long as if, if I, occasionally I have used reinforcement of EPTFE in the cruise, I uh, try to avoid a tearing effect in the uh, in the muscle and maintaining the epimysium intact also makes a better repair. In my first case, I have totally um, gone through the epimysium on the left cruise, uh, but it was a difficult dissection. Uh, many of the dissections being done with my from my fellows, I tend to do the repair myself. Uh, but uh, they're very challenging and complex. So 
uh, and it's a mobile structure. It's very difficult to uh, 30, 50 percent of them they will come back. But in the very elderly population, really, it's about buying a little bit of time with better quality of life. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. The issue, though, is when we come across these, you know, these chaps who've got a BMI of 50. And you, and, you, and you come in to do their sleeve or their bypass and half their stomach's in their chest. And, and we certainly see them. Um, and, I, and they're the ones that I, more than in the frail old, old ladies, they're the ones that I think the relaxing thing can help. So, so do we have any other of the uh, commentators who'd like to um, discuss the videos? Perhaps Marina or Ken, have you got any... Uh, anything you'd like to put forward? I, um, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to review those videos. And um, I, I have some, I've sewn the, the meshes in place and, and um, I, I feel that that is fairly safe. I've not uh, tapped them. I know that um, actually George has done a great job in, in using tacks in that area. Um, the one thing though is while I have the glue or inguinal hernias to hold the mesh in place. I have some concern about using the glue alone to fixate at the hiatus only because everything is moving. The esophagus is moving, the stomach is moving and the diaphragm is constantly moving. So I, I'm not, I, I'd be interested to hear what the rest of the panel feels about just the glue and, and how successful it has been. I think when I reviewed the data on the hiatus hernia, um, I think you have to sort of tease out the class of mesh. I mean, of course, most a lot of the history, historical data is a PTFE mesh, but the biological mesh actually have two classes. One is true biological, and the other one is biosynthetics, which is like um, bio A mesh, which is essentially like Maxon sutures. Those are behaving differently and cost wise is different as well. But the Oschlager study show quite a significant you know, recurrence rate in terms of biological mesh, let alone the cost of it. And Marina is right. I mean, the diaphragm moves six times per minute and we're standing the round of golf and all the other things happening. And you've got the esophagus that is constantly um, swallowing wine and food that is going down as well. So it's a moving target. Um, I mean, I myself, I use bio biosynthetic mesh because Calvin Heger famously teaches us, think of the next guy who is doing the operations. And PTFE mesh, when you come back, the scarring is just really difficult, like what George said. I mean, I, I, I do relaxing sutures, but I actually do it on the right side. So I have to be careful of the IVC instead. But, um, but I think uh, that's my take on it. I, and about synthetic mesh, you can cut it whatever shape it is. So I cut it like a hay shape. Essentially, you just sit there like a horse and you don't, the esophagus is on the, on the thing. And nowadays I add a little thing on the front called the Sydney Harbour Bridge because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, I think a lot of the recurrences, if you can see, it's quite difficult to cross on the anterior or the superior, sorry, of the esophagus. And I think a lot of the recurrences is from there. I mean, I, I, would, I would like to hear from what other panels say. Well, that's certainly where lots of the tension is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, getting it to come together without tension is quite difficult sometimes, particularly in, in heavier people. Um, who else? Anyone else like to comment um, about right, these? George. Okay, George. this is Juan Antonio from Mexico. Okay. Okay, the point is not the suture, the glue, the configuration of the mesh or the type of the mesh. My concern always is what happened with the complication after the mesh? I have had complication and severe dysphagia. The patient cannot eat nothing. It's very important that because maybe with a real type of mesh configuration, or but the point is the complication. I think to talk about the complication because the problem is big problem with the patient. And sometimes the next surgery is life threatening because it would be a major surgery. This is, in my opinion, the most important point. Well, it's exactly what Ken said that Kelvin said to him years ago, you know, that you got to think about, about, you know, what's the next operation going to be like because so many of these fail. 
and I, and I think it's it's a really important consideration. Anyone else? Um, I just yeah, can't... George. Oh, hey. Hi, hi. This is Lena Katon. Um, yeah. So you know, thank you for sharing those videos. I think they um, bring up lots of uh, great points for discussion. And uh, you know, and I think all that's been said is is makes a good point. I think that a couple things that I'd like to add to it. Um, Dr. Boza talked about the uh, dysphagia and that is a real thing. So, you know, from what I've seen when we're putting the mesh in to avoid that, avoiding a circumferential mesh seems to help with that as that can lead to stricturing of the esophagus. Um, the other principle that, that I've used in my practice, I like the biologic um, because Marina was on a nice panel during our SAGES meeting and and really what the debate ended up being was that the, the mesh did not prevent necessarily the recurrence. As everybody said, this is an extremely, extremely dynamic area. There is going to be some recurrence, but maybe the mesh delays the recurrence um, uh, to a little bit later. And then the biologics make it a little nicer for the next person to come back. And then the last um, concept I'd like to talk about is, is tension um, because the big problem with recurrence of any kind of hernia is tension. So um, when you're bringing the crura together, you definitely wanna make sure that the crura are approximated around the esophagus, you know? And so you may have to do that relaxation. I do what Ken does is more on the, the right side. And as I'm approximating the crura, it almost kind of starts to separate itself. You can see that weakness there. So I think it's really important to place that um, mesh uh, overlying that area, um, but it secures and reinforces the closure. And then I think uh, I like the suturing technique. And the reason I like to put the sutures in is I place two sutures right at the base of the, or the most cephalad anterior aspect of my curl repair. And by doing that, I'm distributing the tension that's being placed on the cura to the mesh itself. Um, so that it uh, isn't all just uh, the cura itself, but is distributed to the mesh. And so I think the mesh, that helps uh, in that area. So those were my comments. Thank you very much. So, so Lena, what do you think about, did you do anything specifically at the anterior part of, of the defect, like in front of the esophagus as a separate entity? So I honestly, I don't think I've ever placed mesh anteriorly. Um, but I have put some sutures anteriorly when I see what I call the speed bump. You know, when you're doing your posterior closure and you see that esophagus, and I always have an endoscope in my room. And so if I start to see the esophagus start to do this over my curl closure, then I'll put some anterior sutures to prevent that speed bumping because ultimately that does affect the dysphagia and the progression of food. And, I've seen some patients several years out where that speed bump really caused a problem. So that's where I'll use the anterior sutures. Very good point. Um, and I, I use anterior sutures, a very large hiatus hernia. What you find is the left cruise is much longer than the right cruise. So when you try to put them together, you almost see like a triangle going on to the left. And that's where you get most of the recurrences in the hiatus hernia. So putting sutures on the left and lifting that left crus up. So we put two or three sutures where it goes down on the left crus sequentially, but stays at the same place on the right. So it left, lifts the left crus right up to there. And you see quite nice sort of both crew crew sort of kissing the esophagus quite nicely. But that seems to work quite well for these hernia tests. With most of because in my experience on the on the giant hiatus hernia on the left side where the left crus is too lax. And we also see it in barrier. Patients, you know, when you do a sleeve and you just fix an average hiatal hernia, if you don't, if you, they'll often come back anteriorly if, if yeah. you don't do it adequately, I think. Yes, yes. And we certainly learnt that the hard way with bands and sleeves with hiatal hernias, you know, because we went through a phase of just doing the anterior repairs for the little dimply things uh, rather than what, you know, the giant ones we're talking about. But it's interesting, even with those little dimples, that in people who were symptomatic, that there was an incidence of them coming back if you just repaired them anteriorly, because I think there was too much tension there. If, if you want to remember Les Nathanson's, uh, your neighbors, I mean, yes. who just retired, and he's the one that famously like saying what the 
uh, Lena say about anterior repair, he's a favorite for that to push the esophagus down rather than lifting the esophagus from the back. And I think that's merit to it. I want to put something controversial. I also using uh, V-lock sutures as well as a continuous repair. And I often do some seromuscular tacking along the esophagus to the cura. I think this can cause a little bit of a controversial because a lot of the people are thinking the esophagus is quite sacred and shouldn't be sutures or tag. I mean, I, I would love to hear what other people think. Uh, so one comment and question. Uh, no, I wouldn't do that, Ken. <laughs> I think the esophagus moves too much around there and it's, it's the physiology and I think uh, you will tear that and, and I'm not sure that's gonna make any difference. Um, except when you had the, your first leak in the esophagus and then you will stop doing that. Uh, no, no, I just wanted to ask if uh, concerning having all these experts around and reflux and, and, and bariatric surgery, uh, are you doing something? Because in, in my perspective, the biggest issue about uh, reflux and sleep is that for some reason, naturally, the sleep tends to go up uh, when the year goes by. So I think that's the natural, natural evolution of the sleep uh, when patients regain a, a bit of weight and year goes by uh, and without the attachments in the stomach, the sleep tends to go up. Um, do you think when you see those, not formal yatal hernia, but loose G junction, patients that have you could do in, in my endoscopies when I see that I lose yatus. Sometimes I'm closing the yatal, uh, the yatus just because of that. Uh, but I'm, on the other hand, I'm not, I, I'm not agreeing on closing everything because I think that uh, you end up making new yatal hernias. But is there any opinions yep. about uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the stomach somewhere? Uh, attaching it to, uh, to uh, omentum or 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 doing something on the sleeve. Yes. We have we have uh, we have a strategy is that we adapted uh, in our institute that we divided the patient into uh, 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 different categories. If we found a small hiatus hernia less than four centimeters, and uh, we have a good pillars, we can do cruroblasty and hiatoblasty and the sleeve gastrectomy. That's all. If we have a, 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 a weak pillar and uh, still the hiatus is less than four centimeters, we can also uh, 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 add uh, either a biological mesh or add the ligamentum teres augmentation to the hiatoplasty and completing the sleeve gastrectomy. The third group, if we have uh, a dysplasia or a giant hiatus hernia or uh, 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 in uh, baritosophagus, we convert all those patients to row and y gastric bypass and and either to fix the uh, stomach with uh, a couple of stitches, non-absorbable stitches, and uh, assess the pillars. If it is weak, we add uh, stitches. And if it is uh, strong and uh, it is fine, we didn't add any, uh, any, any uh, measures uh, to that. I, I, I want to, to, uh, uh, to comment one comment, last comment about the, the, the technique of uh, fixation of the mesh. I, I have, I want to share a, a one patient passed away from me because I fixed the mesh by a tax. After 24 hours, the patient, uh, after discharge, he uh, uh, complained from cardiac tamponade and we lost this patient. Uh, I think this is a message from here that we have to take care with the penetration, how deep is the, the penetration of the tax uh, that, that we, we, can, we cannot control it uh, because of the spiral manner of it and the uh, power that we can uh, put this uh, text. And also I, 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 I see that the surgeon may be able to take a couple of stitches. He, ex he is experienced enough to uh, take some, some of stitches rather than to use the text in a dangerous area that may be, uh, affect the pericardium, that may affect the, 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 the big vessels here in this uh, tricky anatomical area. And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I recommend to use uh, uh, a couple of stitches, but, but uh, the glue, I didn't try it uh, uh, till now. Thank you. I want to comment uh, really quickly on Camilo's uh, appreciation of, of the surgery of the gastric sleeve. I think he's right on, spot on. You've got a big stomach and you're 
First of all, you remove all the fixations. Then you cut it and you make it look like an esophagus. I mean, the, the logical thing is that why not expect it to go up into the chest? Now, uh, retrospectively, I've always found the severe refluxes to have a hernia. So I've, I've, I've rarely seen somebody that has severe reflux after uh, a gastric sleeve and not have a hiatal hernia. So- Oh, I see many, I have many, I can send you. Yeah, but probably those have esophageal pathology. But no. what I'm trying to say is that if there's something to fix, let's fix it or let's address it. And uh, yes, it's a fact that hernias tend to, uh, or, or sleeves tend to herniate up into the chest. Uh, one of the things that we have found is that if you have a hiatal hernia, sometimes you can use the fascia in the, uh, uh, relaxing the fascia, but using fascial flaps to cover that hole because sometimes not, you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to reconstruct that clamp anatomically again because they're so wide. Other times we do have to go up into the mediastinum and actually pull uh, the adhesion so we can have a relaxed, uh, no tension GE junction inside the abdomen. And last but not least, we have found that uh, uh, adding the um, weight of the omentum, but not the traditional thing we see on video where you grab the omentum on the side and just stick it back. We actually weigh it down by pulling hard on that lower omentum and attaching it to the highest part of that uh, procedure, most of the times being a sleeve. And we found a reduction in the number of, of, of patent or, 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 or large herniations after surgery. Just wanted to make that comment. Oh, but um, I mean, the, the, the mechanism of reflux after sleeve gastrectomy is not just the anatomical with high hernia recurrence because we know that sleeve is a high pressure system. We know that lower esophageal sphincter pressure goes down. Um, so there are other factors which actually are at play in causing the reflux with the, but, but I agree that the, the, an undetected hiatus hernia is probably one of the big um, issues here. It just seems silly not to repair it if you see it, even yeah. if it's small, because, um, because what Camilla said before is what we all see all the time. These things slide up into the chest. And, and I think, you know, it, there's definitely a group of surgeons who don't really believe in repairing even these small defects. And I think it's just asking for trouble. Right? So that's been our bias about it. Well, if I may say something, there, there's uh, a question uh, from one of uh, the attendees, and I think it's uh, quite relevant uh, considering the discussion we've been having, and it is whether a video showing one of these relaxing incisions can be uh, demonstrated in, in any one of the webinars. I think that that's important, and I'm sure a lot of people do really do not know where exactly is uh, the incision to be placed on the right or the left. I think that's also another matter of uh, discussion as to which one is better. So that's a question that is being asked. I, I, I really don't know if there's going to be one available immediately, but I think it's something that can be considered to be put on online along with this webinar. All right, we'll so if Paris is watching, he can also add in like where you put the mesh because I routinely put the mesh in in the reverse C format and I've seen other people put it almost like a keyhole and others even do just an anterior. So it'd be great to get a different uh, set of videos. Exactly. Yeah. We'll definitely get our panelists to uh, help us with some uploads for the videos and we'll post them on social media. Further to Professor Karim's experience, we have also had some experience with uh, cardiac tamponade. So we have moved away from putting Protax on the left of the patient. We use a couple of products to fix it on the crural prostate, and then we suture the mesh on the left. We used to use non-absorbable meshes, but we moved away. We have stopped using bio air meshes because we've had lots of recurrences. So we use the bio design mesh, but we use we put the U at the bottom on top of a couple of uh, sutures uh, of ethibon. We did and anterior crural repairs, or a couple of them either side to make sure there's no hump there, which we think is the major cause for dysphagia. While doing a sleeve, if you find a dimple, we try to repair the hernia. And then sometimes we do have poojis with a calibration tube and a balloon. So we get the anesthetist to blow 20 cc in the balloon and pull it up. 
if the balloon disappears, we invariably go and dissect the hiatus and fix it. And we have found that to decrease our uh, sleeves migrating into the chest. So, I mean, uh, there are there are case reports of uh, cardiac tapenade from suture repair as well, because the pericardium anterior is literally paper thin and heart is beating right above it. And it's usually a little coronary that gets kind of pricked, uh, even temporarily, because Heine van der Waal from South Africa actually presented a case I was presenting in a conference where he had a similar thing and the patient died on the table with the tamponade. So the important thing is that anteriorly and around the aorta area, one has to be extremely careful um, whatever technique we're using um, to secure the mesh or perform the repair. Let, let me add a little bit on the uh, problem of hysteria, which is very uh, decisive for the patient. So I think if we would do, we would do the partial or if you do a uh, complete, it need to be loose and the crucial uh, closure, it need to be not too tight. Uh, for sure, if we decided to use mesh, uh, yeah, keyhole uh, shouldn't be used because that could uh, contribute to the dysphagia. For the um, uh, fixation, I would say I prefer the suture technique because like, we can control the uh, depth of the uh, suture, the needle. Um, if you do a uh, tackle, yes, of course, I want to do on the uh, right side. And uh, Guru, I'm not um, uh, like um, uh, Camille and uh, um, Mar Marina already mentioned about the, the glue, the uh, movement of the target organ. Thank you. Do you use sizing bougie for, you know, making the size um, tightest? No, no, actually we used to do that. Then uh, we do is very loose uh, fundification and we do the uh, complete uh, fundification very loose um, for that part. We do. I think, uh, you know, like Camilo Boza said, dysphagia is a very bad problem after this and much worse than reflux. So we make sure that nothing is too tight and. I have a good feeling when I can pass a bougie real quick uh, after all my repairs done, just to avoid the postoperative dysphagia because you know the patient is coming for weight loss, has a small hernia, probably asymptomatic, no reflux known, and then ends up with dysphagia. That's a much worse problem to have. I think we have to be careful with all these repairs about the postoperative dysphagia, and I agree completely with with the. Uh, what Camilo said, dysphagia is a worse problem than reflux. I'm sorry, uh, one last comment. Uh, yeah. uh, healing patients with sutures and tacklers, I think that's a very bad idea also. And I think uh, in more than 8,000 sleeves uh, that we have done in, in our unit, uh, we have one, one uh, dead patient that died the same day of the surgery after a uh, other hernia repair, it wasn't my case. But uh, I totally feel that it was uh, uh, something in the in the order uh, because it was a sudden death the same day on a on a low BMI patient. So I think you have to be very careful that area with the, with the cava and with the aorta around. Uh, you don't have to mess with that. Another thing about assessing the reflux is um, I think after sleeve particularly there is a little bit of history taking that is important. I think I start taking notice when they say that I've got exit coming back at the middle of the night because some of the reflux could be relating to stricture lower down of the incisuria and the patient is volume eating and they get back to the bad habits of eating too fast, eating too quick, and then they feel a food regurgitation. I think George would have agreed with in the post-band era, like left band, when they eat too quick, they get food coming back to the esophagus and they complain is a reflux, which is not. So, so we routinely using CT um, 3D physiogram to assess the distal, just to make sure that we're not barking up the wrong tree and fixing the esophagus, but not treating the problem distally. I'm gonna reinforce what Dr. Loy just added because I think sometimes you get in the problem where you wanna offer more and more surgery to correct the problem. Um, particularly as with dysphagia. And we've had some success with biofeedback 
behavioral therapy in response to some of the dysphagia rather than trying to make the perfect hiatus. And as you guys have all discussed, the hiatus can be very challenging. So sometimes doing less might be more and then working with the patient outside of the OR may be more of a benefit. I think yeah, when it comes to dysphagia, um, when your patient cannot swallow the day after comfortably liquids, you should take them back to theater and undo a little bit of repair. It's much easier to do it then. Uh, for me, if they cannot uh, swallow comfortably liquids the morning after surgery, that's an indication that they are too tight. There's a natural tendency to make the hiatus tight, which you need to resist. It should comfortably accommodate a buzzi and still leave space around it. Otherwise, uh, you, when you get the, uh, the, the, the surge of inflammatory tissue uh, because of the natural healing process, which usually is maximum around six weeks after surgery, they can get really tight and very miserable. So if we have liquids the day of surgery, that's a good sign for me. And occasionally I've taken someone back to theater to take one suture out because they were too tight posteriorly. There are a lot of uh, questions uh, that may be uh, yeah, answered in the future about the best uh, maneuver that be uh, that have to be done in the uh, joint head hernia. Is it uh, Ron Y gastric bypass or other procedures? What are the indications, the strict indications of uh, applying uh, the type of mesh, which is uh, yeah, uh, uh, bio biological mesh or uh, non absorbable mesh to avoid any complication? We have to uh, both strict indications. Uh, like uh, redo cases, uh, weak pillars, old age, and uh, uh, recurrent cases. And also, um, uh, the other point of view is the technical uh, technicality of preparing the, uh, the hiatus. Uh, it, it, the recurrence may be uh, due to weight regain in the future, it may be uh, secondary to a structure in anatomical uh, disorder the, with the, the surgical technique itself. M many aspects to be discussed in the future about this uh, uh, non-answered non, non, questions uh, in, in the future. Professor Evangelos, uh, can we have some closing remarks for this video session? Uh, from my point of view, uh, always treat the height with respect. Never make too tight. If it looks loose, presumably it's all right. If it looks too tight and you start wondering, remove one suture to make sure that there is no uh, dysphagia. And uh, if you're gonna use ducts, uh, be extremely careful because I was very surprised by the uh, reports from colleagues around the world of uh, patient loss uh, because of uh, injuries. I do quite a lot of medical legal work, and uh, you know it's it's you know it's very difficult to defend this, these injuries medical legally. Uh, safer is to suit to the mess. Uh, when the techniques develop and will have a better quality of messes, I think glue will be. Uh, fairly secure to keep the mess in, in place at the moment. I don't think we have the perfect mess. And also, uh, the glue delivery systems they have their problems. So, personally, I would say with the mess fixation with sutures. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. Register to obtain CME credits for this and upcoming events at sinya-mad.com forward slash IBC 2021. To view past Hot Topics and Surgery episodes, go to ibcclub.org or any of our social media platforms. And mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress has been rescheduled to September 19 through the 21 of 2022. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless.
Today, we have Guy Miller from Advanced Medical Solutions. All right, tell us a little bit about the product. Um, liquid band fixate was the first device to be developed. Um, laparoscopic delivery of cyanoacrylate adhesive for the fixation of mesh and inguinal hernia repair. And it's designed to deliver specific drop of 0.0125 grams to the location of the mesh, where it then bonds the mesh to the tissue intended as a replacement for the spiral tank. Um, polymerization occurs by coming into contact with moisture in the tissue. The adhesive turns from the liquid into a solid and bonds the mesh to the tissue. As mentioned, the cannula length is 355 millimeters. And the tip is specifically designed to not bond to, to mesh or to tissue and to allow the management of any, any polymerized material at the end. The adhesive is held in a glass ampule in the blue lever. The lever is pulled back to break the ampule, where the adhesive drops down into a little reservoir here, and is pulled into the delivery syringe by pulling on the red tab. This pulls the adhesive through a filter, which filters out any glass, ampule, glass material from the ampule, and then you close the blue cover to make it in line with the steel cannula. Remove the rear red tab, rotate the blue dial at the back, so the trigger is released. That's pushed the adhesive down to the end of the cannula. And you simply press the trigger, deliver your adhesive drop. Wonderful. And I understand you have two types, one for laparoscopic, one for open. So this is the fixate open device. Again, no steel cannula this time, but we still have the tip that won't stick to mesh or tissue. Um, again, the difference here is the tip is projecting the adhesive to the sides um, to make it easier for those blind applications. Um, and the tip will remove removable so you can then close the topical tissue, topical wound. The main difference here at this time, the ampule is at the back of the applicator, and it's a simple case of rotating the tip to break the glass ampule. Again, you can see the adhesive drop into a reservoir. You then push the plunger to transfer the adhesive to the delivery syringe, rotate that to close off the delivery syringe, and then you rotate this dial to prime the device. And again, this time, you're just simply pressing the adhesive trigger to deliver the glue. To find more information about your product and your distributors, where can uh, our viewers go to? So if you go to our website, um, www.advancedmedicalsolutions.com, there's a specific portal and page on our liquor band range of both topical and internal adhesives. And specifically, there's a section there for liquid band fixate. Um, you'll be able to find links to informative videos and instructions on how to use the device, but also on how to contact the company directly to, to purchase the device. Wonderful. Guy Miller from Advanced Medical Solutions. Thank you for being on Spotlight on Industry.